Greetings to all in the name of our blessed Savior Jesus Christ. Well, it's an honor for us to continue uh, to praise the name of the Lord. And that is why we want to thank Him so much for your lives, for your families and for the work of your hands. Well, after considering a number of teachings that we have done uh, in the area that is to do with the, with the doctrines of grace, the five solars, the, doctor, the eternal decrease, the eternal also talked about the doctrine of election, uh, the doctrine of uh, reprobation, and many other important things that we we had to deal with. Uh, it's best that we also consider this great aspect of who God is and his attributes. Who God is and his attributes. So now the thing about this is just to ground our listeners more and more in some of the things that didn't rightly come out for some of you. We know that there were some disturbing things as, as far as all those doctrines are concerned because many people have never been introduced to who God is. And it's very difficult to put different things together when you do not know who God is. When you do talk about things like the eternal decrease, these are hard things for many to believe. Even smart Christians struggle with those doctrines. Because the thing is that if the foundation is not okay, your house will be a house of cards to fall down. You won't be stable you won't be well grounded. And so by the time we come to things like uh, election, you still see a lot of people struggling. How can that one be a Bible God? How can that one be a true God that has a right of choosing some and then leaving others? And so we pushed it harder. And we took it to the area of the sovereignty of God. That was indeed a rare subject to several people. Because majority have been taught the sovereignty of the devil other than the sovereignty of God. So they have always been told that the devil can do anything. That yes, there is a God, but God's plans can be frustrated by the devil. And then we come out and we say, God is not only sovereign in creation, He's sovereign in salvation, He's sovereign in His will, He's sovereign in healing, He's sovereign in providence and history. 
Amalek, what are you saying? Dano wanyo ni indagatika wachu ni ngon. So the blame is not on us. Loki ini po kate konwa. The thing is that how you were started on. Loki tiye me ni kitma ki chako yin kera ye. We are doing everything possible to bring a balance to a lot of things that were not properly taught to many of you guys. Dano wa tika tote me ke lo jeme du chuma ruate wa ko yubu kitma ki fonyo kere chana yon pima bae. So with this subject at hand, uh, that is to do with who God is, when you just hear it, us talking about who God is, you might take it as a basic thing, as something that is not very important, but under the ten areas of theology, this is the area that will put all other places in their rightful position. If you are wrong about the doctrine of God, you will be wrong in so many other areas. It will also be very difficult for you to believe in the scriptures because you don't know the author of the scriptures. And uh, so this is not basic. It's a very important subject. Though many are actually very much estranged from it. And from the very start I want to say this. That uh, the subject of who God is. Is indeed a vast subject. As we are going to consider a number of scriptures to prove my point. So this is going to be a condensed teaching with the aim of clearing some misunderstandings around this subject. And uh, since God himself has defined how he should be worshipped as far as John 4 that he should be worshipped in spirit and truth the reality is there is no doxology without theology in other words that the moment our theology our knowledge of God the moment that knowledge of God is not proper of course, it will be very difficult for us to give the glory that actually belongs to God or to give God the glory that indeed belongs to Him. So what we are basically saying that the moment our theology is not biblical, it will be very difficult for you to properly give the honor and the glory to God. For our theology determines everything that is to do with how we worship God. And the right theology about who God is results in right worship. And failure to know know who God is due to mingled and twisted theology results in a false worship. God is our true north. And if we go wrong on knowing who he is, like the word of faith movement, like the new apostolic restoration movement, like the prosperity camp, we cannot fail to end up with a wrong practice. That is why this subject is indeed very important because it deals with the most important being of all things.
And that is God. But as I'm talking right now, the mainstream church has indeed started what we call a strange fire about who God is. That is why things like little God's doctrine, Christian science, of course it is a misnomer, it is not Christian and it's not science. Things like positive confession have become the staple doctrines of most of the churches. And today, we are seeing a redefinition of that which has been given unto us once in the scriptures. So this subject that is to do with who God is it has to be dealt with a lot of care. That's why many great sound theologians also attest to the fact that when it comes to the doctrine of God as far as theology proper is concerned as far as theology proper is concerned our knowledge of who God is is limited to that which God has revealed of himself in his written word. That's why scriptures like Romans chapter 11 verse 33 they communicate a lot to us in 11.33 it says all the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. I just want to add on to that by also bringing in Job 42 and a verse 3. It also concretizes on the same subject, on the same uh, 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 reality. It says, Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Listen to that. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I didn't know. These are all things to help us understand the richness of actually how God is him being infinite meaning he has no limit he transcends in excellence and glory but man is a finite being so when you hear Job say who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Just actually explains a lot to us. There are things about God that we shall never know. For he actually hides counsel without knowledge. You see things happening, but you do not know how they do happen. So dear ones, listening. We can never fully understand God. And uh, that in sense is that God is incomprehensible. In other words, he is unable to be fully understood are understood. And I want to use a scripture there from Isaiah chapter 40 and verses 28. Just 
us to put a more concretized emphasis onto what I am basically saying. So when you do consider chapter 40 and verses 28, it says that have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. But listen to that. His understanding is unsearchable. Now him being infinite and us being finite, we can never fully understand who he is. It should also be made very clear that we can know some things about God is love, power, wisdom, mercy, grace, and many others. Uh, but the reality is we cannot know them completely or exhaustively. That we, we know something about God is love. But we do not know it completely or exhaustively. What is also amazing is that even in the ages to come when we shall be freed from the presence of sin we will never be able to fully understand God or any, any one thing about him you hear mammons say that at death they become gods but you that are listening God is incomprehensible and his incomprehensibility is attributed not to our sinfulness but to God's infinite greatness. Take an example of Psalms 145 uh, for us to have this one very clearly taught. It says in uh, verses, uh, verse 3, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. So I think we are talking about that the incomprehensibility of God is attributed not to our sinfulness, but to God's infinite greatness. Job chapter 11. Let us also see what it concretizes on the same note. And with this you'll understand there are many pretenders who say that they properly know who God is. But from the verses we are using before I even begin on some deep things, just realize that we have a lot of people that are unbelievers but with a Christian language. Job 11.7 says Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? Now why do we have these verses in the Bible? It's because we cannot find out the deep things of God. It's because we can never come close to the limit of the Almighty. And this is all actually given unto us in the scriptures. So that we might behave ourselves well. So that we may not exalt ourselves. But the intention is not understood by many. It says in Psalms 92 verses 5 How Great are your works, O oh Lord. Your thoughts 
tell me a very deep to to ah these are all things in a jam do you to properly put us in our place we okay why ka beru wa ke come and it is also amazing to know that to be good to all me but for all eternity ni pe car me get pe chon to we will be able to go on wa mo me de ke wala ni increasing wa we met in our knowledge of god in your way come no ba that the moment you put off this sinful body da ka de ah ke come in me bale that is not when you arrive on to knowing all of that who god is in e don po bu chore ngero jam du chuma kwa ko ba the moment we shall put off this sinful body da ka de nen wa ah ke come in me bale and we enter into glory ci don wa don ye de yo then we shall begin a new wa we cha ko platform of beginning to learn wa we cha ko ko ma nyen me cha ko fo nyen the thing is this logatika man when you do study kai kwa from a uh, When you do study from Psalms, kai kwano ki jabule 139. Mi achep ya de rabongwa. David makes it very clear for us. Da wudo wa ka maleng bodwa. Verses a 17 and 18. Tenga para ber ka para. It says how precious to me are your thoughts. Wa ene loki monya de twal bora ki tamme. Oh God. Oh Lord. How vast Large is the sum of them. Large ni ki lok mo kana ni. If I would to count them. Kana romo kwano ge. They are more than the sand. Di dong lo kweyo. Mark that. Koi nan kong lok. They are uncountable. Pe ki romo kwano ne. We are talking about infinity. It ki kwano ki mo ma pe ki. We are talking about things that are beyond searching. What ti ka lok kom je me ma pe ki romo kwai to tara. At this point we need to remind ourselves of what Stephen Chanock said. E ka bero ino mi ara kom po wai kom ngo ma Stephen Chanock wa jo. He's one of uh, the 16th century puritan. O bere kom jo ma gi bere ma ka me par bi chele. He said, wa jene. That though angels behold the face of our heavenly father. Me kere beti lo malaika ge nano wang lo ba o mati polo. The sense now that is communicated niki niki wajo is that they see some signs of his presence niki nano ger la nyut mo ko tiene and majesty ki dite which is more expressive man nan to twan and ever appeared to man ki ma chalo nan ker bo dan in this life e ko ne but the essence of god ento nyai ko mlo ba is invisible to them penen bo gi is invisible to them penen borgi and hidden timu kana from them ki borgi in the secret place e kaber memo of eternity e kar me agike listen to this kenen ko as far as what actually chanok said ken ma chanok wa no one knows god but himself fitting at me ken ma ngelo ba eto en kere Look at that. You thought you know God. But the thing is that no one knows him but himself. Let us factor in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 2. Chuanario and the verses 11. It actually agrees with the words of Stephen Chanock. Yeah, bene kom lok pa Stephen Chanock. For who knows a person's thoughts? Anga mo ar mangeo tampa ngat mo ni. Except the spirit of that person. Kono chun pa ngat ane ke ka. Which is in him. Matie. So also, ene be tie. No one comprehends the thoughts of God. Peting ngat mo ken ma romun yang e kom tampa lo ba. Except the spirit of God. Kono chun pa lo ba ke ka. Now I think that one should come us down. A town ene rom mero mo lo peng. No wonder the apostle said what he said still in Romans. Kere be ka ma no fu be wa yan lo ka chele Uh, chapter 11 chuara parachel the verse 34 to 36 singe pia de ba ngwan chel pia de ko biche paul made it very clear paul wa ka maleng for who has known the mind of the lord anga ma no ma do nge tampar wat o has been his counselor no mi tamo who has given a gift to him anga mo mi e mod mo that he might be repaid me wa ko dua ke bore that is a thing No one has known his mind. The emphasis of the apostle is indeed built on to what he said in verse 33. Tio gete kom ngoma ena wa nyenge pia dapa. That all the depth of the riches and wisdom. Ni nan kong 
tutte che riavvone che ne c'è a knowledge of god che bei parova how unsearchable are his judgments che mango lo cope pe varomo quete ne and how inscrutable his ways da che ma io ne petante now the whole thing about all this ya me ducu ma qua lo che ne is just to humble us che mer me qua ko ben ma mol always to be willing to learn wa ta ducu o bet che mi re mi fo nye non to ever think that we have arrived pe me ta mo ne wa ndo wa o the lot of in videos that have been taught a lot of dog food to down my pole make for you gi ki champa go but they do not even care to learn anymore dem be pe pardon me for you come like me rich me under oh but with a lot of things that are unbiblical on no get ki ngay my pole ma perwa da ki lo ma te ba arrived in knowing who god is get down on gi oh ngin ken malo ba ber cha no quent on to say cha no ko me de watch ko na de tout of the divine essence ki ki palo ba perfections e berone manotia te and decrease ki ki mayo che ko ke a anon pengene to any bon ngat mo ke ke but to god himself eto bodlo ba en ke na he only knows en ke na nge o what he is anga ma en be and what he knows ki ngo ma en nge o what he can do ki ngo ma romo tim and what he he decreed to do ki ngo ma en che o ne be tim o but then you so bring in some hope wa ko mera nga kel gen mo ke na that ne in glory Ideo as compared to now kid ma chara warong po our kumbaya. knowledge of god ngaitwe komlo ba will be more accurate abu beru dak ma bad to us than makaro now kita ko beru chara is the meaning of what we do see in etian lok ke komlo ma wana in the book of 1 corinthians the book of jo corinth mo ko chapter 13 chuo na para da as actually uh, seeing some of these words here ka wana no lok ni mo ka na when paul was writing to the corinthians ka pa no tika cho ro bon jo corinth about some of the things e kom lok ma kwa ro lok e gini ah if we may just use verses 12 it says that for we see in a mirror ka wa tika tiki tinga pa re wa ni wa na ni mara right now Combate. All that we know about God is in form of a mirror. Jame duchuma wange komlo ba ber chalo gen ma wata ne ana mara. It's known clear. Petit malin de toi. Says for we see in a mirror dimly. Wa ene wa ne ne mara matila yila yi. But then face to face. Eto digi machare wanke wan. That is when we push shed off this sinful body. Eno ne ka de ne wa wa ko komi ne ba le. He says now I know in part. Wa ende ange ni chinichu. Now just take it from the apostle himself when you make people like when they come no when you hear people talking about realms dimensions okay when you down to watch and i don't you it am mogo no ngech mogo let them not deceive you with those english words pay we go for like let more market on no any person has arrived putting at my can mado o and no any person will ever arrive putting at my can mabe bu o into completely understanding who god is ingeno duchu duchu ken malo ba de kere now a man dano that was divinely inspired says what he says here mano chuin palo ba timo pong e chuin wa yo ken mo wa yo kere kanye and as he was writing kano anti ka chot he was actually divinely inspired to write this chuin palo ba tele me chor jamene that us and him the one can all we know right now is in part you may do you know when you go be chat tin nuchu nuchu then i shall know fully diga ye ba be ngeo mo pom even as kere ka bete i have been fully known and when you ngeo yo that's why we are saying and now we are watching about you that in glory at least me deo oluto our knowledge of god will be more accurate as compared to now ngech way kom lo ba mo ber ma be ko por ko bete but as far as we are talking eto ma kwa ko ken ma wa ta a lot of things that we do not really know to jai ma por da ma pe wa ngeo so even though we cannot know god exhaustively kere ka bete pe wa romo ngeo lo ba yo mo por da in this life the quality we can and know some true things about him waromunga er je mogo ma dai come i hope you follow me very well atik gen ne otika lo kama ba much as we cannot know him completely kere bete pe waromunga er en mo pong du chu right now kombete we can know some true things about him waromunga er je mogo ma dai come the key word is some some true things about him lo ma pier ta ki na en je mogo ma dai come according to that which god has revealed e kom ngo ma en do yabo of himself in his written word ma kwa ko lo come gi na choya the point is that lo ke en ti ne all scripture tells us about god gi na choya du chu en lo ko but why come lo ba is true ni lo ba ti ada as far as 
the prophetic Old Testament and the Apostolic New Testament because it was inspired of the Spirit of God. Therefore, if we abandon scriptures, we shall fall short in knowing who God is biblically and in the end will be wrong about everything. This also means that the knowledge of who God is is very important because that knowledge determines what we believe and how we worship. So that is actually the central thing that I need us to understand. So in simplicity, uh, the simple way we can define who God is or describe who God is, we can say that God is the creator and the sustainer of everyone and everything. He is eternal infinite and unchangeable in his power and perfection in his goodness and glory in his wisdom justice truth and nothing happens except through him and by his will. Let me back up again. God is the creator and the sustainer of everyone and everything. He is eternal, infinite, unchangeable in his power and perfection in his goodness and glory in his wisdom justice and truth and nothing happens except through him and by his will. That is a simple way from the scriptures put together for us to describe and to define who God is. Let me begin by using a list job here. 3626 this is what it says. It says that uh, behold, God is great and we know him not. I'm not beginning a new doctrine. All the patriarchs of faith are saying the same thing. The number of his years is unsearchable. Now when you do consider Psalms 90 verses 1 uh, to verses 2 you cannot also fail to see this reality. It says from everlasting everlasting Lord you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting you are God that's the reality guys he has no beginning he has no an end and so to begin on to understanding the attributes it's very important to first of all uh, know something a little bit about English word that is known as attributes. When we do use the uh, the common uh, modern English dictionaries. This is what we, we basically mean by that word. Attributes refer to the qualities. Uh, 
that belong to a person. In other words, the attributes are the characteristics of a person or futures that usually define a person or a group. Okay, therefore, an attribute Speaking of one is what we attribute to another person. So when we speak of God's attributes, we are simply referring to his nature, his character, his personage. Now when I speak of personage, still you hear that I'm meaning who he is. His essence. And uh, the being of God. The qualities of God. So before we get into all this. Just a simple highlight of the waters that we are about to tread. Some of the attributes are the aseity of God, the, the spirituality of God, the holiness of God, the transcendence of God, the sovereignty of God, the wrath of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the eternity of God, the immutability of God, the infinity of God, the wisdom of God, the simplicity of God, mystery and many others. Those are some of the attributes. There are very many. But before we begin to define some of them, it has also to be made very clear that uh, God is being is not a collection of attributes added together. Let me back up again. God is being is not a collection of attributes added together. As if God is some kind of, of a collection of various attributes added together. So when I speak of uh, the, the veracity of God, the triunity of God, and then I do speak of the constancy of God, don't look at God don't see God as a collection of attributes that God is veracity constancy sovereignty triunity plus 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 that is not who God is understand this the truth is God is whole being includes all his attributes they are present in the entire Godhead that is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is no any attribute that is missing in any member of the Godhead. Whether you're talking of righteousness, holiness, with the only difference existing in their roles. So, dear ones, every attribute of God mentioned in scripture is true of all of God's being. They are eternally permanent in the entire Godhead. That is also to mean 
that each of the attributes have always belonged to God and will always belong to God. He loses none of his attribute and he adds nothing. This also helps you and I to never think of God's attributes as something external from God's real being. As if attributes are something added unto who God is. I have also to say this that this teaching about the attributes of God is one of the most rare topics that are taught in many churches. And because of this, teaching receiving less attention in the mainstream church is why majority have now formed a God in their own mind and after their own image whom they worship. A God who is non-sovereign to do whatsoever he pleases to do. A God who is a servant of his creation. A God that can be commanded by his creation to do all that they want. A God who is only love and is not a God of wrath. So I want to make this promise that by the time we are done with this subject you will have a true unmixed up knowledge of who God is because the attributes of God define and describe for us who God is as revealed in the scriptures. It is also so important for us at this very start that we make it very clear that God's attributes fall under two main categories. We do have what we call incommunicable attributes and what we call communicable attributes. Now listen very carefully about these two categories. When we speak of incommunicable attributes, these are attributes which belong to God alone. In other words, they are attributes that are exclusively belonging to God alone. Okay, to put it in a layman's language, there are certain attributes that God will never share with any man or any created being. They only belong to him. That's why we call it the exclusivity of those attributes belonging to God alone. Things like sovereignty, omniscience, omon presence, things like infinity, things like immutability. These are things that no one can share. But today you hear a lot of false ministers who know not about attributes saying that they have these things. But since we are not dwelling on the false teachers who know not their boundaries the second group is what we call communicable attributes the word communicate is the same thing as to transfer or to share so these ones that we call communicable they are shared they are transferred to all created beings uh, mainly when we talk of birds, animals, man and all other things so but with them they are basically the ones which are in God 
Listen carefully. Okay, we know that. But he also shares them with his creatures in a small measure. There are all God's attributes. But sovereignly, he chose to share in a limited sense in a minute sense in low levels with, all he, with his creatures things like mercy goodness love Ma, wisdom. So the thing is this. These ones that are communicated to us. The ones that God shares with us. We do have them. But we do not have them. Listen to that word. We do have them. But we do not have them. In their full perfection. What am I saying? We can show mercy. We can be good to others. We can love. But we do not love as God loves. We can show mercy. But we do not show mercy as God shows mercy. We can forgive. But we cannot forgive as God forgives. And uh, since God is glorified chiefly in his attributes, let's now consider some of them briefly. Now, beginning with what we call the aseity of God. When we talk of the aseity of God, we are simply saying uh, God is self existence. And so the word aseity comes from the Latin word, which means from self. Aki come. From Selef. Aki come. Get that one right. Okay. From Selef. Aki come. In that we are saying and only know what you are watching, eh? that to have a being Maybe one, eh? and existence within one is Selef. Now that is not normal. It is not anywhere normal. Why this what we say? John 1 4 says, In him was life. He doesn't get life outside himself. It is the meaning of the Asiati self existence. Our God exists in himself. That is why. In a tian loca, self sufficient, anti moromo pier canon, self satisfying, anti mupomo pier canon, self governing, anti madoro and pier canon, self glorifying, da caro de come pier canon, a good who is self sufficient, the bama timoromo pier canon, self satisfying, matie mupomo pier canon, self governing, madoro and pier canon, self glorifying, da macero de come pier canon, needs nothing from his creation. So with this, when you understand it, it will actually debunk a lot of these four things you hear on the radio and the TV by the preachers. Oh, God needs you. He needs you so much. He could not be in heaven without you. God wants to be in relationship with you. Believe on him. Him. He's desperate for you. Those people know nothing about the aseity of God. My dear ones, God does not need any part of his creation in order to exist. And what I feel so bad about is some of us coming out and representing ourselves that we are speaking for God. 
call us God's minister, servant of God. When you're just a servant of ignorance, we are misrepresenting God before his people. We say a lot of wrong things. Even when God has made it possible for us to have an access to his word. It says in Acts 17, 24. Why teach Paul the God, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth. Does not live in the temples made by man. Listen. Nor is it served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. There is a seati. In scriptures, you don't need to first go to a theological college, which is also very important. Because some things you never see them until actually God uses particular individuals that He has gifted to show you particular things. But if, but if you are very careful and wanting to actually know God by using that which He has made available before you, which is His Word. You will at least be able to see some of the things. It says that this God we are talking about he does not need anything. For he himself gives to all mankind life and the breath and everything. What can we ever give to him? What can we ever say that we can ever share with him? I want to bring in a, what actually Job had also to say. Job 41 the verse is 11 He says who has first given to me that I should repay him whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. He is independent. We depend on him for everything. But he depends on us for nothing. And what is very amazing that is that our God he is the one that actually created everything. We have our being from him. Indicating that it is only God who has a siati. We cannot sustain ourselves. We cannot do anything for ourselves if he has not provided providentially. You and I were left with nothing. And the scriptures are very clear. In the same line where the siati is taught in Acts, Dr. Luke pins it down by saying For in him we live Remember John 1.4 In him was life But now listen to us For in him we live Move And have our being Without him None of us can exist. God does not need us. This can actually be one lesson for, for, for an individual. For you to be settled. That uh, there is nothing that God needs from you. And some people think if you don't serve the Lord, God is going to lose something. If I don't preach the gospel, God is 
is going to lose something. If I don't give to God his work, things will not move. Get this right. He doesn't need us. It's part of what we are about to see that we call sovereignty. Everything we shall ever do together with God is because we have understood how we sincerely need always to depend on him. And it's a blessing for us to serve him. It's a blessing for us of what he has given to us to give back to his work. My dear ones, God does not need us or the rest of creation for anything. And this should end this common anthem that is taught and sung in most of the Christian contemporary music. Case in point hill song. They have a, a popular song that is known as What a Beautiful Name. And in one of the lines they say that he didn't want heaven without us. Dear ones listening, that is a needy Jesus. He is a needy Jesus who is not a biblical Jesus. When you do understand the aseity of God, this mindset of thinking God created human beings because he was lonely and that he needed fellowship with other persons dies because it is false our God is completely independent of his creatures, of his creation. But what is very amazing is that he created us and we can actually glorify him and we can also bring our joy to him. But what we should settle onto this or see it as a privilege to serve God there is nothing that he needs from you to continue. What we are doing, we are not doing him a favor right now. We are just in appreciation for the life he has given unto us. The truth he has made known unto us. That he has also enabled us to share it with you guys. We are not that you know is very special. That special thing that is very common with the minister should die for us. What do you have that you never received from God? Respecting a person is not bad. But we should not have exalt ourselves. That's thing that, then the second thing that I need us to consider is what we call the eternity of God. The eternity of God. God has existed from eternity past and he will continue to exist in eternity future. Just like actual one of the theologians made it very clear that God has no beginning and or succession of moments in his own being. He sees all, sees all time equally, vividly, Yet God sees events in time and acts in time. Now, to simply put it, nothing precedes God. That's the entire meaning of what we call the eternity of God. That nothing precedes God. You listen to this. In Isaiah 40 verse 10, uh, 43, verse, 43 verses 10. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. My servants, whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me. 
and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed. Nor shall there be any after me. Those are all things to show us that indeed man has a beginning. Man will also continue on. That is either in heaven or in hell. But his, his beginning is defined by God. The third thing, or the third attribute that is very important, that, is, that, that, that we also need to consider, is what we call the spirituality of God. Get this. God is immaterial. That is to mean, God is without a material substance. Again, to break it down, our God is without a physical body. He is a spiritual substance. John chapter 4:24. God is a spirit. And because God is a spiritual being, that is why he is among presence. He can be in all places at all times. There are no restrictions or limit unto his presence and knowledge. He is a personal being. That's why he has a mind. He has a emotions. He has a will. Now get this also. Since God is a spirit, this is also another thing that we need to debunk in the church. He cannot be seen. How many of you heard telling you that I saw God? Uh, God visited me. I had a conversation with him. The spirituality of God simply means he cannot be seen by mortal men. Get that right. And mark and avoid all the false teachers who are telling you these things. He is invisible because it's immaterial. When you see, when you consider what Paul wrote to Timothy, and now since this is a pastoral letter, and one says it's a pastor, but he goes wrong onto this. That he has visitations of God. That he has seen God. It's high time you think about your resignation. From the pastoral letter, the first letter, chapter 1, it says in verse 17, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible. He says he's invisible. Someone says he has seen him. Something is wrong with this picture. He says to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, to the only God, the owner, and glory, forever and ever. Amen. He is invisible. And he only made himself manifest in the incarnation. John 1 14. So now you understand why the scripture says that the just shall live by faith. And some go beyond that scripture <laughs> and say living by faith is not enough. I also saw him where it is says to him that is invisible. He cannot be seen. The fourth thing. I mean the fourth attribute that we also need to consider here is the infinity of God. 
The reality about this is that uh, God is without end because there are no limitations, restrictions on him. And why is that one so? Because God is a divine spirit being. He has no boundaries. He is free. From physical limitations. It is not limited by time and space. The thing that is made very clear about the infinity of God. The book of Job also helps us to really understand the infinity of God. Chapter 5, verses 9. It says, Who does great things and unsearchable? Marvelous things without number. Chapter 9, verses 10. It says, Who does great things beyond searching out and marvelous things beyond number? So if, you, if you think chapter 5 verses 9 was a coincidence chapter 10 verses 9 comes in to say the same thing that's also considered chapter 11 of Job and verse 7 it says can you find out the deep things of God can you find out the limit of the almighty so about the infinity of God God permeates all other attributes. And uh, there's one of uh, the great mathematicians known as John Carter. Now, John Carter's work on infinity in mathematics was actually accused of undermining God's infinity. But John Carter, uh, John Carter, uh, an saying that God's infinity is the absolute infinite, which transcends other forms of infinity. That a mathematician also said that that the language of infinity is there in mathematics. But the infiniteness of God transcends all other forms of infinity is what he told. Whether you are learned or unlearned, we all both down unto him. The other attribute for us to consider is what we call the immensity of God. That basically means that nothing can contain God. And 1 Kings 8.27 makes it very clear. In the words of Solomon, he said, What house shall we build for you? And in Isaiah, he says, On the earth, he only just rested his foot. The other thing here is what we call the sovereignty of God which we elaborated more in other teachings. But it has to do with God having absolute control. Control over all things in heaven and on earth. And that nothing happens directly or indirectly without his permission. And that no one and nothing can thwart his will. I remember we use also Isaiah 4610. But uh, one of the theologians known as A.W. Pink said this. He said that God does as he pleases 
Only as he pleases. Always as he pleases. That was actually A.W. Pink. The other attribute uh, is actually the holiness of God. The reality being God is the pattern of holiness. And holiness began with him. Psalms 12 verses 6 and it is his holiness that makes him glorious and what is very amazing is that Stephen Chanock said that the holiness in God is far above the holiness in saints and angels that God is transcendent high and lifted up he is morally perfect pure blameless Habakkuk 1.13 also concretizes in the same note now the common ones to people today is God being omnipotent and that God is all powerful and uh, because of time I'm going to just actually give to you the scriptures about some of these. So when you study from Naum 1.3 Naum 1.3 Naum 1.3 It says that God is all powerful. And the other one is what we call the omniscience of God. He is all knowing. Isaiah 40 the verses 28 makes it very clear. Psalms 147. The verses 4 to 5. And when there's another one. The omon presence of God. Him actually being present. All time. David makes it very clear. In Psalms 139 verses 8. To verses 10. And to where can I run away from your presence? When I go to heaven, you are there. When I go into hell, you are there. So nowhere to run. Another one is what we call the immutability of God. But God never changes. He never actually increases and never actually decreases. James 117. Numbers 23:19. Well, a dead piare lamentation. Chapter 3, verses 22 also makes the same emphasis. But on the immutability of God, I love what one of uh, the, the Dutch theologian that is known as Herman Banvik said. He said that although the Bible talks about God changing a course of action or becoming angry, he went on to say these are the results of changes in the heart of God's people, in the hearts of God's people. The clear evidence is in Numbers 14. But Banvik goes ahead to say that scripture testifies that in all these various relations and experiences God remains ever the same. End of quote. Another one is actually what we call the forward knowledge of God. The reality being that God has nothing to learn from his creatures uh, for him to act afterwards. He knows the secrets of the hearts of men. And uh, Psalms 139 verses 4 is very clear. Uh, before a word is on my tongue, God knows it. 
very amazing. His knowledge is instantaneous. There is no error in the knowledge of God. Now, let us also consider what we call the triunity of God. In that, we are saying God is three persons in one. That is Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. One word between my lane. Distinct but not separate. Now, this is one of the, uh, the doctrine that many have really proved to us that they are indeed false teachers. It's commonly known as oneness Pentecostalism. They teach that God actually is one but actually manifesting in different modes. They eliminate the language of persons. Now, commonly, what I grew up hearing that yes, we serve one God who keeps on manifesting in three different ways. That in the Old Testament, he appeared as the Father. In the four Gospels, as the son. And after the resurrection, he's the same but now he's in another form. He's now like the spirit. And there are the example was the example of water, ice, and steam. And so that is how they explain the triunity of God. That is the same thing. This is the same thing. It shows the naivety of people teaching such things. We are talking about God is three persons in one. Distinct but not separate. To simply put it, the Father is not the Son. One word. And the Father is not the Holy Spirit. One the, the Son is not the Father. What one? And the Son is not the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit is not the Father. One. And the Holy Spirit is not the Son. Now, we should do our work with all these other things we have always been hearing. Jesus is not God the Father. God the Father is not Jesus. The Holy Spirit is not any of the other two. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Jesus is Jesus. And the Father is the Father. We should do not commingle things. Jesus made it very clear. In Matthew 20, 28 19, he was, when he was commissioning his, his disciples, he said, Go ye unto all the ends of the world and make disciples of all nations. Listen, listen. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That, that is the thing. These are persons. One God in three persons. Now, I think I may also have. Uh, to consider another thing later on that will bring a clarity to what I'm saying. The other attribute that is known as the oneness of God. When we speak of the oneness of God, to bring the one of, uh, of the Trinity to be very clear for us. When we talk of the oneness or the unity of God, we refer no, I tell you, to God being one and only. Now, when you go to uh, to the early centuries after the apostles had gone, a man that is that is renowned throughout church history, that contended for the triunity of God, was known as Anthanasius. Now, Anthanasius. Anthanasius. Later on. 
inge developed what we call the Athanasian Creed. Oti uno fonyo aki komnyene. And some of the words were like this. Loke mukano berkama. We worship one God. One one of ancient in Trinity. Mayeta da. And triunity. That team agyo repela ka in unity. Ikira matia da. Let me back up again. That is for all of us as Christians, true Christians. We worship one God in Trinity. And it's Trinity in unity. That's why we talked about we talked about three persons distinct but not separate. That's where the unity comes in. And in Deuteronomy, which is known to the Israelis as the Shema, it says in Deuteronomy 6 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, Paul. Paul, under his Pauline revelation in Ephesians he went ahead to explain to us verse 6 saying one God and the father of all who is over all and through all and all now Jesus made an emphasis to it also reminding his audience of the Shema that we saw in Deuteronomy he said in verses 29 of chapter 12 of Mark Jesus answered the most important is hear all Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one now that is the thing dear ones we should do away with the common lies of modalism that God is just changing modes like we begin with ice I mean with water ice there is also steam this is it is very commonly propagated by a man that is known as T.D. Jokes and Stephen Fantic that first teaching is also very common here in Uganda. You go and tell people to explain to you Trinity. You're going to say a person coming with three buckets there. Now you'll also do the same thing I've just told you. There is water, ice, and steam. In other words, the Father is the Son the Father is the Holy Spirit. The Son what? is the is the Father I am and is also the Holy Spirit. I am and the Holy Spirit I am is the Father I am and is also Jesus. I am that those are modes. I hope that actually is a blessing to you guys. The other attribute that as we bring to a close is what we call the uh, God is love. Because we know spe uh, scripture speaks uh, to us that God is love. First John 4 8. John and scripture also speaks to us about uh, the Father's love for the Son. And his general love. All believers and unbelievers. That's why the sun actually rises on the land of the just and the unjust. Just. But also the scripture speaks of that of God is electing love. The, the love for only those that he gave to his son. As Romans 5 8 makes it very clear. That while we are still in sins, Christ died for the ungodly. But we also need to talk about this one here. The attribute that is to do with God is wrath. The most fought. The most hated. In the Sika generation church. This one here. 
Ini. is just close chora, chora. behind the, the sovereignty of God as far as the ones that are hated most but the thing is this to you dear ones God is wrath is a necessary part of his character in his being for God to love purity listen to that for God to love purity he must also hate impurity that has to sink in that is to mean God has to carry vengeance and wrath towards all that which is unclean and impure now hear me again on this the mainstream church puts less emphasis onto this attribute why? they say this is one thing that will put so many people off that will present a God who is unkind but you also need to remember this that uh, at one point, I heard about something that was to do with one of the American church that wanted to add a certain hymn in their hymn book. That hymn is known as In Christ Alone. That certain church wanted to add this song in their hymn book but they had a problem with this song that is known as in Christ alone one line was not rhyming well with their theology and so the line that didn't go well with them goes like this till on the cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied so now they didn't want that so what did they do they wanted to have some changes and so they contacted the hymn writers who happened to be Keith Getty and Stuart Thousands and they said they want this line to go like this till on the cross as Jesus died the love of God was magnified what were they trying to do they wanted to eliminate the language of wrath so, but when they, uh, they, they contacted the hymn writers the hymn writers said no the scripture teaches about the wrath of God if you do not want to add it in your hymn book it's okay but leave the hymn that it has been written so dear ones you can actually also be able to see that some people are, are indeed distinct in their theology that the God of the Old Testament is not the same God of the New Testament but you that are listening you should know that that is the common actual anthem today there are people who are preaching what they call grace which grace goes beyond that which is written believe the way you want I mean he did it all on the cross the love of God was magnified you, you know you can now do whatsoever you want but we need to understand one simple thing dear ones listen. our God does not change he is the same in eternity past and eternity future he is the same God always and everything he says or does is fully consistent with all his attributes listen to this if God was to lose any of his attributes he would cease to be God that's why we are 
saying some people are worshiping a different god. And now we are wondering, you can't get a wall of our back. Say that we are tough on them. Go at your watch, you know, ticket to get to lock my table. How can we help not saying what we are saying? What Romo can you name me watching one more pega? When the people are saying that God lo actually lost one of his attributes, can you can get a wine in Loban or when you care a cello? My dear ones, God is attributes are inseparably interconnected. You cannot divorce anyone from another. So if you want a God of love and him not being a God of wrath, just go and find a, another person. Go and find another being to worship. But the God of the Bible does not lose any of his attributes. Now it has also to be understood. Uh, that uh, there is also what we call God's grace. That is also another attribute of God. We see God being gracious. Ask that He chose us before the foundations of the world to bestow His salvation unto us without any good deed we did. Contributed. Ephesians says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. The scriptures make it very clear how gracious God is. But uh, we need also talk about the goodness of God. That God is the final standard of goodness. He's the final standard of good. And that God uh, and, uh, and that God and what he does is worthy of approval. He's even good to the unbelievers. Their children are born. They receive some education. Some are born with strong bodies than the believers. He showers the rain on their grounds. Their plants grow. They receive job promotions. That is the goodness of God. So, but when you also talk about the righteousness of God, that is to mean God is righteous. Righteous in all his in all in all his ways. And uh, th these are indeed uh, things that are common to us. The righteousness, the holiness. But because of time, we have to stop there. Others are there that you can do your own study about. But what needs to be made very clear is that. Uh, when we talk about the attributes of God, they are distinct uh, and not separate. I hope you can also uh, connect with what we talked about uh, the Godhead. One God in three persons. Distinct but not separate. That's how the attributes are. That they are actually distinct but non separate and each attribute works in perfect unity with other with another attribute for so they all pull in the same direction and there is no conflict with each other so this has been a long one and uh, it has an intention just to clear off some things about this subject. That uh, we should have at least a, a, a proper glimpse of who God is. Uh, and the attributes help us to know who he is. And, and some of these that we have gone through, they just demonstrated 
wanted to ask how we, we can actually come to a place of saying that I know something about God. I know that God is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. So some things just to know. Some of those other attributes that are hard we have also talked about. Uh, the triunity Unity, the oneness, the infinity of God. We have also at least addressed them. Just for you not to have this thing that uh, many people today talk about and which is not well balanced. Understanding the asiat and the spirituality of God. When you understand those attributes, your theology will begin to align with the rest of the scriptures. So we pray that the Lord will use this for his own name and glory. We have no part in this. Just like actually David said. Known to us, Lord. Not us, Lord. But to you alone be the honor and the glory. And to you that have been listening, we just want to say, that may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And shalom. Coach.